Welcome to the video for chapter 35 of the Cambridge Introduction to Sanskrit, which is going to tell you about perfect active and middle participles and about comparatives in yas and iyas. Sanskrit forms both active and middle participles from perfect verbal stems. We're going to start by looking at the perfect middle participle because that is formally simpler than its active counterpart. Now, the perfect middle participle consists of three elements, the weak perfect stem, the suffix ana, and case endings. So, for example, on the basis of yud, to fight, we get the weak perfect stem yuyud, and on the basis of that, we get our participle yuyudhana, meaning having fought, and that then just declines as yuyudhanach in the masculine, yuyudhana in the feminine, yuyudhanam in the neuter. The perfect active participle also consists of three elements, namely the stem, a suffix, and a case ending. And two of these three elements are completely straightforward and used throughout the paradigm, namely the weak perfect stem and regular consonant stem endings, as they had been introduced in chapter 15. However, the suffix between these two is a little more complicated. In its regular guna, it would be was, but it never appears in its regular guna form. Instead, in the strong cases of the participle, this suffix appears in vritti and nasalized as once. In the weak cases of the participle, before case endings that begin with a vowel, it appears in zero grade ush. And what we have here is the regular guna was minus the guna vowel a. And that would theoretically give us us, but through rookie, the s after the u changes into sh, and so we don't have us, but we have ush. And then finally, in the weak cases of the participle before case endings that begin with a consonant, the suffix appears either as what or as wad, depending on whether the consonant follows is voiceless or voiced, instead of appearing as a form of was. Finally, this what also appears in the nominative, vocative, accusative, singular in the neuter. This may all sound horribly complicated, but actually the participle is rather easy to recognize because we have the perfect stem with its reduplication, and then we have the consonant stem endings that allow us to recognize fairly straightforwardly which case of this participle we're looking at. So what we have here is the paradigm of the perfect active participle of ker, to do, meaning having done. And let's begin by looking at the weak cases, so from the instrumental onwards. Again, the strong cases are shaded. Now, in the singular, we have chakrusha, chakrushi, chakrushach, chakrushach, chakrushi, for both the masculine and the neuter. This consists, or these forms consist, of our weak stem chakr, plus the suffix ush, plus the endings a, e, ach, ach, i. So what we here have are weak cases, and specifically we have weak cases whose endings begin with a vowel, and in front of this vowel, the weak form of the suffix appears as ush. So chakr, ush, plus our endings a, e, ach, ach, i. In the dual, on the other hand, we have the forms chakr, wad, bhyam, and chakru, shoch, What's happening here is that, again, we have the weak stem, chakr, the weak perfect stem, plus, in the case of instrumental dative ablative, the suffix appearing as wad in front of the ending bhyam. Now, bhyam is an ending that begins with a consonant, and in front of consonants, the weak suffix appears as wad, and in front of consonants that are voiced, it also ends in a voiced consonant, so in d, chakr, wad, bhyam. In the genitive and locative dual, we again have an ending that begins with a vowel, so the ending would be och, and in front of this och, the weak suffix again appears as ush, and so we get chakru shoch. Then in the plural, in the instrumental dative and ablative, we have endings that begin with consonants, so we have bich, biach, and biach, 
and again these begin with voiced consonants and so in front of these voiced consonants the weak suffix appears as wad so we have chakr wad bich chakr wad biach chakr wad biach in the genitive plural, we have an ending, am, that begins with a vowel. In front of that, the suffix again appears as ush, and so we get chakrusham. And finally, in the locative plural, we have the suffix su. Su begins with a consonant, and specifically, it begins with a voiceless consonant. And so in front of this voiceless consonant, the weak suffix appears as wat ending in a t, which is voiceless, just like the s that follows. So we have the form chakr wat su. Now on to nominative, vocative, and accusative, which in the singular and dual, masculine, are strong, and the nominative and vocative plural, which in the masculine again, are strong. So what we have in the singular, nominative and vocative, chakr wan and chakr wan, as so often, the nominative and vocative masculine singular of a consonant stem have endings that are difficult to predict and also perhaps difficult to recognize. So these two forms should best be simply memorized, chakr wan and chakr wan. Then in the accusative, we have chakr wan sum. So what happens here is that we've got the weak perfect stem, chakr, then the suffix in vritti and nasalized, wans, and then our normal accusative singular masculine consonant stem ending am, chakr wang sam. In the masculine nominative vocative accusative dual, we have chakr wang sao, so again, weak perfect stem, chakr, plus our strong suffix, wans, and the ending ao that we know well. And in the masculine nominative vocative plural, we have chakr wang sach, again, weak perfect stem, chakr, plus the strong suffix wangs, plus the ending that we also already know, ach, giving us chakr wang sach. In the accusative plural in the masculine, on the other hand, we have a weak case. And so here we have our weak stem, chakr, our weak pre-vocalic suffix, ush, and the accusative plural ending, ach, so chakrushach. Finally, for the neuter, we have in the nominative vocative accusative singular, the ending what, so we have the form chakr what. In the dual, we have the ending e to form the nominative vocative and accusative neuter. And in front of this e, which begins with a vowel, the weak suffix again appears as ush, so we get chakrushi. And then in the plural, where again, we strictly speaking have a weak set of forms in nominative, vocative and accusative, we again have something that looks strong because what we have is a long vowel, a nasal, then our stem final consonant, namely this S, and then the vowel E that is added or that, that stands at the end of these nominative, vocative, accusative, neuter forms that we've seen. So, for example, wanani, um, warini, madhuni, and so on. So what we have here is chakr wangs looks like a strong form, chakr wangs plus E, so chakr wangsi. At this point, hopefully, you should be able to recognize a perfect active participle when you see it on a page in a Sanskrit text. However, these really are used rather infrequently in classical Sanskrit. So even if your aim is to write in Sanskrit rather than just, in quotation marks, to read Sanskrit, you will not normally need to form one of these perfect active participles. So really being able to recognize them is what we're aiming for here. However, if you do want to write in Sanskrit, then perhaps consider using as an alternative to perfect active participles, the tawant past active participles that were introduced in chapter 25. That said, we need to look at one perfect active participle in just a little more detail because it's perhaps the most frequently used perfect active participle and also it is slightly formally irregular and that's the perfect active participle of with meaning to see or to know. 
WID lacks reduplication, both in its finite perfect forms and in its participles. So the first singular perfect indicative active is WEDA, meaning I know. And the perfect active participle has the stem WIDWAS. And it declines just like any other perfect active participle. So nominative singular masculine WIDWAN, vocative WIDWAN, accusative WIDWALSAM, and so on be able to recognize this form, widwas, meaning knowing or skilled. Finally, the feminine of these perfect active participles, we haven't looked at that at all yet, is formed by adding e to the weak participle stem. So we have, again, chakr, our weak perfect stem, then ush, which is the form that the weak suffix takes in front of a vowel, um, and then we have E and just generally long E stem, long I stem endings. So we have chakrushi for the nominative singular, chakrushi for the vocative, chakrushim for the accusative, and so on. A form that declines fairly similarly to the perfect active participle in was is comparatives in yas or iyas. We already encountered the regular comparative suffix, which was tara. This was introduced in chapter 9, and if you remember, it's added fairly straightforwardly onto the adjective stem. So, for example, from an adjective like priya, meaning dear, I might get a comparative form priya tara, meaning dearer. However, some adjectives either also or exclusively use the suffix yas which sometimes also appears as ias. Now, before this yas or ias, the stem of the adjective often takes an unexpected form, and generally speaking, any stem-forming suffix, so anything at the end of the adjective stem, such as an, in, u, thematic, a, and various others, often is dropped. The remainder of the adjective often appears in a higher vowel grade than the basic adjective, or the vowel of what remains may be lengthened. So, for example, on the basis of priya, meaning dear, we get the comparative preyas, meaning dearer, and that then goes with the superlative preshta, dearest. From guru, meaning heavy or respectable, we get the comparative gariyas. Then, going with the um, superlative shreshta, meaning best, that we've already encountered in some readings, we get the comparative shreyas, meaning better or superior. Now, you may find it a little difficult to recognize gariyas on the basis of guru. This is the same for most people, and therefore you will basically find all of these comparatives, priyas, gariyas, shreyas, and so on, listed in any vocab list or dictionary that you might be using. Now, to help us recognize the various cases of these comparatives in yas and iyas, let's look at their forms in a little more detail. The suffix undergoes stem gradation. So in the strong cases, it appears as yas or iyas. And in the weak cases, it appears as yas or iyas. And the suffix has the same sandhi as other s stem forms would. So as remains as as before vowels. It appears as O before voiced consonants, and it, it appears as Visaga before unvoiced consonants, i.e. before SU, which is the only ending that begins with an unvoiced consonant, i.e. the locative plural. The feminine of, or the feminines of comparatives in IAS add E to the weak stem, and are then declined just like regular long I stems, so just like Nadi, and so, for example, from Shreyas, we would then have the feminine Shreyasi. And just to be thorough, here we have the paradigm of Shreyas, meaning better, in the masculine and neuter. Again, the shaded fields are the strong cases. Let's begin with those this time. In the masculine singular, we have Shreyan, Shreyan, Shreyansam. So, Again, masculine, nominative, and vocative singular, often with an ending that isn't quite predictable, therefore needs to be memorized. Shreyan and Shreyan. Then in the accusative, we have our strong stem, Shreyans, plus our ending, am, that we know very well from the accusative masculine singular in consonant stems. 
then in the dual shui yang sao same thing strong stem plus the ending ao that we know and in the masculine nominative vocative plural we have shui yang sach Again, the strong stem with this yans plus the ending ach that we know. Then in the accusative masculine plural, we have the weak stem, which is shreyas, plus our ending ach that we also already know well for the accusative plural in consonant stems. Then the neuter nominative vocative accusative singular is just the stem. There is no ending added and it's the weak stem, so it's shreyas, which through external sandhi appears as shreyach. Then in the dual nominative vocative accusative, we have the ending e that we already well know, giving shreyasi. And then in the nominative vocative accusative neuter plural, we once again have a form that basically looks like it's strong. And again, we have a long a, a nasal, the stem final consonant s, and an e, so we have shreyang si. Then the weak cases are, as always, the same for both masculine and neuter. So in the singular, we have the weak stem shreyas, plus our well-known endings a, e, ach, ach, i. So shreyasa, shreyasi, shreyasach, shreyasach, shreyasi. Then in the dual, we have shreyobhyam and shreyasoch. So in front of the ending bhyam for the instrumental dative and ablative, the stem shreyas changes through internal sandhi into shreyo. So just as we had from manas, where we got manobhyam, here we have shreyobhyam. And then in the genitive and locative, we again have an ending that begins with a vowel. And in front of that, shreyas appears just as it is, shreyasoh. Then in the plural, instrumental, dative and ablative all have endings that begin with consonants and specifically with voiced consonants. And in front of these, once again, the weak stem appears as shreyo, giving us shreyobich, shreyobiach, shreyobiach. Genitive plural has an ending that begins with a vowel, namely am. And in front of that, shreyas appears just as it is, shreyasam. And then finally, in the locative plural, in front of the ending su, which begins with a voiceless consonant, shreyas appears as shreyach, giving us shreyach su. That was it for this chapter. We hope that you found this video helpful and if you have any comments or suggestions we would love to hear from you. Please do write to us at ruppel at cambridge-sanskrit.org. And now for your own work on this material, good luck and have fun!